The challenges facing our teens today mean that more than ever, we need to be there to support them and encourage them. The Dr. Stem Show is here to provide discussions about topics that will help promote healthy relationships, self-image, and success for teens, parents, and the community. Our young people can achieve more in life than they ever dreamed possible. The Dr. Stem Show, hosted by Dr. Stem Malatini, will foster these discussions and encourage your participation. My guest today, Jack Whalen, a cancer survivor, says the topic of cancer and discussion of cancer will show up at your breakfast table. Welcome to the Dr. Stem Show and welcome Jack. Hello. Hi. Glad to be here. It's to be not here. an easy topic that will show up at the breakfast table, I tell right. you. Right. But I thank you for coming in to us today. I know you're a patient advocate for cancer, doing legislation advocation as well, but there is way more to you <laughs> than just being a patient advocate mm -hmm. and a cancer survivor. So may I ask you to tell the audience who you are? Sure. Well, yeah. first, thank you for, for having me <laughs> here today. Um, Part of my uh, medicine is to talk about cancer and to help people understand the experience of cancer. I was diagnosed um, about seven years ago with the rare, what I say, not yet curable, people use the word incurable, but not yet curable blood cancer, a lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, uh, which at that time indicated about a five-year outlook. And I felt, um, you know, sort of like riding a roller coaster. It's a very scary scenario. Um, you're not quite sure what the outcome will be. We think about cancer in a very fearful way. Um, but I met with a cancer team in Boston at a, at a leading academic institution, and I've developed a real confidence in my care and in the research of this rare disease. So um, I've become what's called an e-patient, mm -hmm. uh, an educated, empowered, engaged, sort of electronically connected patient. And uh, that is part of my medicine, to learn as much about this enemy um, as possible. And so I'm really happy to be here today and share my experiences and hopefully uh, your audience can benefit from some of those experiences. Thank you very much. And you know, we're talking about an audience. The show mm -hmm. itself is geared towards helping teenagers, mm -hmm. you know, the parents and, and yeah. uh, teachers, empowering, inspiring and educating mm -hmm. them. Yeah. Yeah. So the reason why when I met you at mm -hmm. the Toastmasters meeting mm -hmm. and so how jovial and mm -hmm. how just mm -hmm. relaxed and outspoken you mm -hmm. were about the disease itself, mm -hmm. I thought, you know what? Mm -hmm. We are now having more and more kids being diagnosed with mm -hmm. cancer. Yeah. There are also more teenagers and more kids that are dealing with parents mm -hmm. that have cancer. Yeah. So I thought, wow, what a way that we can have you to come and make it as simple yeah. as it's supposed to be on mm -hmm. understanding the mm -hmm. illness itself. Yeah. So when you say e-patient, mm -hmm. what does that mean exactly for somebody who's been yeah. diagnosed with cancer? Well, the E, you know, comes from, uh, you know, like email, electronically connected, um, engaged, and I think education is perhaps the most important thing okay. to learn as much as, as we can about cancer. Um, you know, with what we're learning about genetics and genomics, we're learning more about um, the, what, where, where cancer comes from. It comes from the misspellings or software bugs, if you will, in mm. our DNA. Um, the DNA is part of the the software instruction set in the middle of a cell that uh, tells the cell to divide and to mutate and to become a cancer cell. Yeah. Well, if we can find a way of shutting down that signaling that says become a cancer cell, we can either manage or cure cancer. And so if you're a young person, um, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic. Yeah. Um, rather than looking at treatment from a historical standpoint, I encourage people to look forward, to look at new technology, look at what's available in clinical trials, because in many cases, the emerging or novel agents that we're developing yes. to fight cancer are more effective than conventional chemotherapy. So especially for young audience, and, and it, it affects all of us, no matter how old, whether you're a teenager, a young uh, student in high school or yeah. college, Sooner or later, as I say, the topic of cancer it will. will show up at your breakfast table. I, you know, I also liked when we were preparing mm -hmm. for the show, mm -hmm. I asked you about, you know, the teenagers and you shared with me a story mm -hmm. of, you know, how you showed up at this, you know, teen <laughs> right. meeting that was. Tell right. us about that. Right. There was a, there, in fact, the first <laughs> conference I attended was in Boston and it was a, 
the title of the conference was I'm Too Young for This. Mm -hmm. And I, I was 57 at the time, and I felt I was too young for, for cancer. This is much too young. Well, when I got there, I didn't realize that everybody attending were from high school and college. So I was the oldest person in this group of I'm too young for this. And I thought, well, I'm too old for this. I should probably leave. And all the kids said, no, stay. Maybe, you know, you can tell, you know, tell us about your experiences. Yes. So, yes. so uh, it doesn't matter how old you are, especially if you're young. Uh, it's important to be hopeful and to think about the future because there are many good treatment options. I'm not saying everybody's cancer can be cured or managed but it's really important to be optimistic about the future. Yes. It helps you make the right decisions to seek the right care options. You're right, you're yeah. right. Yeah. And, and you know what, mm -hmm. your story, when you introduced yourself, you mm -hmm. were telling us that when you were diagnosed, you were told you have five years, mm -hmm. and yeah. now it's seven years. Yeah, the, at that time, um, all of the literature, yeah. the internet, everything that was published about this um, rare blood cancer, um, said it's about five years outlook after you begin treatment. And that is the historical outlook. But if you look at novel agents or new developing therapeutics that are coming to market, okay. um, the outlook could be much brighter. And so I really encourage people to look at what's available in clinical trials. Yes. You know, the development of the new medicines is the, the future is, is what we're looking for here. Yeah. yeah. So it's not mm -hmm. just about the illness itself. Mm -hmm. I'm yeah. thinking of mm -hmm. um, someone yeah. who gets diagnosed. Mm -hmm. It's also about the money for treatment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is that mm -hmm. something that people need to be concerned about? Are there resources yeah. that you can share yeah. Yeah. with them? Yeah, well, the, the money, of course, comes yeah. to the old overall question of health care and, you know, who's going to pay for it. Yeah. and. How do we do that? And my personal feeling is that um, half of our cost of health care has to do with preventive medicine. What can we do as individuals in our life to try to prevent cancer? Yes. You know, so we're all told things that we've been told for the last hundred years about maintain our weight and don't smoke and be careful of alcohol and drugs and things like that. And that really helps in half of the health care cost. But the other part, which is very expensive, is the cost of research and the cost of care. So there are a number of insurance vehicles, public, you know, commercial insurance and government insurance that all of us should be participating. We should always be looking at what's available to provide for insurance coverage. But we're lucky in the American healthcare system, we never turn people away. Yeah. So no matter how sick you are, it's really important not to be worrying about the financial aspect. The first thing is to survive, take care of yourself. The bills will take care of themselves sooner I, or later. I like that, yeah. I like yeah. that. The first yeah. thing, is to take care of yourself, exactly. to survive. The bills will be there, trust me. <laughs> so it's almost like <laughs> making a decision when you get the diagnosis, you yeah. have to make the decision, do you want to survive exactly. or do you want to end right. this life, you know, right. as they say, within right. five years or less. Right, right. It, it helps. The, the, you know, the positive attitude, I'm, I'm not sure there's a metaphysical connection, but I think the positive attitude helps you make the right decisions. It helps you show up for your appointments helps you to you know, follow through with infusions. Chemotherapy is no fun. It's a very difficult process and uh, it's something none of us like to face. Um, but when you're in chemotherapy and you're seeing your fellow patients, um, there, are, there are reasons to, be, to have fun while you're there too, to be ah, optimistic. talking about yeah. fun. Yeah. I saw what yeah. you do <clears throat> well, for fun. <laughs> Well, I have, a, I have a, a silly thing that I do, um, yeah. and I still, to this day, I've been doing it for many years. Um, when I'm getting uh, chemotherapy infusion, and yeah. I'm, I'm in treatment now, I typically get infusion every Thursday and Friday. Yes. And uh, one of the things I do is hang a, a bottle of Guinness on my infusion rack, and uh, it's a way of laughing at cancer. It's a way of um, helping the, the medical pros that provide the care. Let them have some laughs along the way, too. So... Uh, I suppose it's a way of dealing with fear, but yes. uh, hanging a bottle of Guinness is one of the things that I do. I've also claimed to be the pizza delivery guy. I'm not really <laughs> here for that. chemo. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm very optimistic about the science, about the bright young investigators and researchers that are behind this. So yes. Uh, yes. I think overall I'm, I'm optimistic. Even though the numbers uh, can be scary, I'm, I'm an individual, as we all are. You're right. You're right. We're talking to Jack Whalen. He is uh, currently going through cancer treatments, a cancer survivor himself. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Today we are talking to Jack Whalen, who is a cancer survivor, and he's helping us 
with information that might help that discussion of cancer that, as he says, sooner or later will show up at your breakfast table. So before we went on break, we were talking about um, <clears throat> some information on you know how to understand the diagnosis but what i wanted to get a conversation you know to continue with the conversation is the way that you've made and you know yourself an advocate for one but how you've been able to cope with it and talk about it as if mm -hmm. you know it's mm -hmm. another disease that you know yeah. everybody gets yeah. how do okay. you do that how do you stay cheerful and yeah, the word cancer, the C word, is C such wit, a scary yeah. word. Um, yeah. Most of us hear it, and we see the, you know, the outcome for many is not very good. Yeah. Um, my feeling is that, um, you know, when you're told you have a rare, incurable, I think of not yet curable, blood cancer, um, there has to be. It's like being asked to, say, you know, sit at a table where you're joining in a game that you can't win. Um, my feeling is to learn as much as possible about the cancer. And the reason I'm optimistic and positive about it is that I look at the care team that includes people that do the research in the lab. These are very bright, young investigators. Everyone's young to me these days. <laughs> but these are the investigators that work many long hours, 60, 70 hours a week, uh, conducting research. And what we're learning in biomedical research about cancer, um, there's a lot of reason to be optimistic. So. My feeling is that life is already too short. Um, no matter how long I survive, and there's a good chance that my life could be shortened from this, it's important to be as positive and hopeful as possible. Mm -hmm. I see every day advances that are being made. We've made so much progress understanding the biology of cancer um, that I, I just feel that I will benefit from, from this research that's underway now. Yeah, how important is, <coughs> is it for us to motivate uh, young people to get into this field and be yeah. researchers or physicians yeah. that will treat you know, cancer? Well, we're fortunate here in Massachusetts, biomedical research is one of the leading industries and it's a, it's a high value industry. This is a the really good paying jobs. Uh, the opportunities for all are, are really fantastic. Um, there's a constant recruiting campaign from biotech firms, pharmaceutical firms. Um, the life sciences industry is very strong, a very vibrant industry in Massachusetts. So um, if I were a high school or college student, uh, I would definitely explore what the options are. Keep those grades up. These are the very bright young kids that, uh, who when I was in high school, were the ones that kept their heads down and studied and looked for the right answer. Well, yes. folks like me were having fun developing social <laughs> skills. Uh, but anyway, I do think that we're fortunate uh, yeah. in Massachusetts. The, the, the job environment here yeah. for bright young kids is very good. Yeah. So, yeah. Tell us about your family Yeah, and I've how been, supportive they've been. Yeah, it's yeah. A, that is another reason to be optimistic. I've yeah. been married for about uh, 43 years. If my wife were here, I'd say that's about <laughs> two years of happiness. Um, I have three wonderful daughters, three great sons-in-law. Yeah. Um, now um, five granddaughters, two oh, wow. um, of five grandchildren, yes. um, two sets of uh, twins, um, another wow. one on the way. So um, we're very fortunate to have a good uh, close-knit family um, who are involved in my care, yes. who have been with me throughout treatment. I've been receiving chemotherapy and a variety of treatments for over, well over seven years. Yes. And part of that treatment is to come home to a, a caring, involved, engaged family. So yes. I'm fortunate to, yes. to have some, some folks at home. Yeah. yeah, and how were they able to cope with it and you know yeah. help you out? Because then most families yeah. are probably wondering, well, yeah. how do I even support a loved yeah. one who has cancer? What do I do and yeah. how can yeah. I help? Well, having three daughters, of course, um, as you can imagine, they're very close and yes. you know they always ask the question, what do you think? You know, how does dad look? Um, there are some days that I don't look so good as a result of chemotherapy, and there are other days that life goes on pretty normal and natural. And uh, so uh, it's, it's good that they care about each other and they're constantly checking on each other. This goes back to the days when they were teenagers and yes. there were certain boyfriends that came along and they, they were smart enough to know, tell him to get out of here. And I think that's what they do now is they engage with each other and they stay close and try to understand what's happening. So um, my wife, uh, who is my primary caregiver, was with me. Uh, every treatment, she's the one who drives every day. When I cannot drive after treatment, uh, she's there with me and has been for uh, for this whole program. So I'm very fortunate to have 
uh, support structure in place. Yes. Uh, and that's important for all of us. Yes, yes, and, um, yes. And mm -hmm. what I want to emphasize to <coughs> those that are listening is, you know, you mentioned mm -hmm. that the caregivers themselves mm -hmm. need support as well. Because in order yeah. for you to be supportive, yeah. you have to be healthy, you yeah. know, mentally, physically, spiritually, yeah. to understand yeah. the illness and how you yeah. can support. This is so so important, so true. You know, we patients um, are, be are are lucky that people focus on patient care and what is it like to be a patient and how can we make you feel better. Um, but what happens, as you point out, Dr. Stem, is that the caregivers themselves, they need help yes. as well. And in this industry, we don't think enough about the caregivers. Um, there's an old expression, when you're on an airplane, they always say, put your oxygen mask on first Very before true. you can help others. And this is important in caregiver yes. circles, that yeah. uh, caregivers need to take care of themselves um, as well as the patient. Yes. And they're at a disadvantage because they don't know how the patient feels. They don't know what we're feeling and what we're thinking. So it's important that we focus on caregivers and and lend them a hand as well. It's yeah. so important. So, or, you know, mm -hmm. on that, for those that are listening and are going mm -hmm. through the illness or have <coughs> been diagnosed with cancer, if you're, a, you know, whether young or old, as you said, it, you know, it affects everyone. Mm -hmm. My suggestion yeah. is that, you know what, if there's no support group where they are, mm -hmm. that you go and start a support group, whether it's at the school, yeah. In the community, at yeah. the church, start a support group so people can get together yeah. and discuss yeah. some of these treatments that you're talking about, yeah. the you know um, options that they can have, yeah. but also to discuss the feelings of you know how am I doing, how am I yeah. coping, and yeah. what do I do next? Who can I rely on? The doctors' yeah. questions that you yeah. might ask because as you know they do that, mm -hmm. they learn more as well because That's education true. is key, as you said. It is, yeah. yeah. I, I actually manage a small support group. We okay. meet every couple of months yes. at Dana-Farber in Boston. I'm not a licensed clinical social worker or anything like that, but as a patient, we get to share our experiences yes. with each other. At our last meeting, we took the support group and broke it into two groups. We took all of the caregivers and asked them to sit in one room and all, the, in one room and yes. all of the patients and put them in another room yes. to share their experiences yes. because sometimes the caregivers are afraid to say what they really feel yeah when they're around a patient. They yes. don't want to show emotion. Yeah. They don't, they, you know, this whole idea of don't be perceived as being weak. It's okay to cry. Yeah. It's okay to be fearful yes. and to worry about your loved one. Yes. And so when we got the caregivers together without us patients, the tough guys, uh, they had a very great experience. And their experiences, yeah. their sharing their experiences are as important as cancer patients sharing their experiences. Yeah, yeah. and I'm yeah. sure even the cancer patients are afraid to say something that might offend the absolutely. caregivers. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. Cancer <laughs> patients don't want to talk about death. We don't want to talk about the fears that you have. You don't want to talk about the pain. that There's a lot of pain associated with cancer. Yes. You don't want to talk to your loved ones that I'm in incredible pain right now. It does not it does make no one feels good about that. So yeah, that's true. we're reluctant to open up, but in front of other cancer survivors, other cancer patients, we're more willing to be open and, and lay the cards on the table and be up forthright. Yeah. yeah. Well, if we were to do an equation, you know, mm -hmm. from school, yeah. cancer, mm -hmm. the C word, mm -hmm. equals death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, you know, to most people. It does. It How does. do you mm -hmm. deal with death? But before yeah. we go mm -hmm. to talk about that, yeah. I'll let you think about it for a second mm -hmm. okay. because we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back. Okay. Welcome back. Jack says, you know what, when you get diagnosed with cancer, it's very, very important that you look ahead, that you don't see it as a death sentence. So this last segment, he's going to talk about my favorite part, I think, of the opportunities that sometimes we get with a deadly diagnosis or with the worst of the worst situations in our lives. And Jack has had some opportunities that I can hear to, you know, wait to hear about because I know you've got a busy speaking schedule. Yes, I do. How did that start <laughs> and were you always a speaker and, you know, great before people? How yeah, is that? Yeah, I've, I've, my career has been involved in high tech sales and investment research. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm a people person. I like to be around people. Um, but when I was told that this was a rare uh, cancer, it was important that I try to learn as much as possible about it. So I started attending life science conferences um, that 
you know, perhaps uh, physicians or researchers or investigators would be attending. And I wanted to learn as much as possible, um, you know, just to be better armed with dealing with this. And as I began to learn, uh, you know, part of my medicine was to share what I was learning with other patients and other caregivers. And so um, I did a lot of volunteer work with groups like the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, the American Cancer Society, and started speaking in smaller groups. And little by little, some of the larger uh, conference producers said, gee, would you like to come and speak to our audience? And so I started getting involved in life sciences conferences. And uh, now, I'm, as you point out, I'm on a pretty busy speaking schedule between chemotherapy sessions. Um, I, I blame it on the effects of steroids <laughs> from a part of the treatment. But um, I spend a lot of time on the road. I just came back from London and from Barcelona. Yeah. I'm heading back uh, to Europe in a few weeks. I travel around the, the U.S. at different life sciences conferences. And I'm representing the patient voice. A lot yes. of times if uh, physicians get together, the American Association for Cancer Research, which is perhaps the largest group of physicians, yeah. um, they meet um, throughout the year and they talk about uh, some very complex t topics. And I like to go there and present to the audience about the patient experience. What's it like to participate in a clinical trial? What's it like to get chemotherapy? Um, what's involved in, in your head? What are some of the psychosocial issues that you're dealing with as a cancer patient? So um, spending time on the road, meeting with other people and sharing my experiences and also learning is, is part of my medicine. Yeah. yeah. Well, just in a few words, what are mm -hmm. some of the uh, pointers that you might give the physicians out there mm -hmm. on yeah. the differences, you know, mm -hmm. with their patients that they treat? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're all individuals. All, every one of us is very different. I remember when my doctor first described my cancer and, you know, and I said, gee, the research I've, you know, seen indicates about a five-year outlook. And she said, you know, don't put yourself in that pie chart with everybody else. We're all individuals. You have their health dividends. You know, you're strong. Um, you've taken good care of yourself. Uh, it's important that you participate in your care actively. And so um, I think being involved in my care was, was a real key ingredient in, in, you know, in managing this disease. Yes. So I tend to think of it as... Uh, even though we use words like incurable and, you know, a shorter lifespan and things like that, uh, there are things that we can do to, um, to lengthen um, the, the amount of time that we have. Um, I've participated in seven clinical trials, six or seven clinical trials yes. over the last seven years. And um, my goal is to achieve these periods of what the industry calls progression-free survival. This is sort of like live one more year at a time. And that's kind of where my head is at tonight, today. Yeah. Live one more at a time. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love it, yeah. the way that you say it. Yeah. And I know that you've also been involved on, uh, with TV commercials. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I, I, I asked somebody, why do I get asked to do these TV commercials? And I think it was... Uh, so one of the larger networks, uh, Good Morning America, said, well, you have the face of the Toyota car salesman. It's a, you look like a very credible person. So, yeah, I, there's a series of commercials now running on Good Morning America, and I've been on CBS Sunday Morning Magazine. Wow. Locally, I'm a big supporter of the, the Red Sox. Uh, Jimmy Fund, uh, raising the big, largest fundraiser for Dana-Farber. Yes. Um, I do work for some biopharmaceutical firms that help educate patients. So it's kind of a, an opportunity. I guess I have a big mouth and I don't mind getting <laughs> behind the camera or behind the microphone. So, and that's why I'm very thankful to be here yeah. with you today. Yeah. I appreciate this. Thank you this. so much. Yeah, thank you yeah. so much. So yeah. scary, not scary, mm -hmm. yeah. how should one approach dealing yeah. with this if they've been diagnosed? Yeah, it, it is a scary scenario. Yeah. I, you know, there's, there's, there's not a lot that you can say to make the fear go away, but it's important that we think about, you know, cancer and how do I play this game? How do I survive? What do I need to do? And the better educated we are, I think the better chance we have at survival. Um, it is a scary scenario. We all know what the numbers are. Um, we still have a long, long way to go in solving what causes cancer. But the good news is yes. biomedical research has now identified many of the underlying causes of cancer. So whether you have a breast cancer, for example, we, we talk about breast cancer, but it's really a BRCA1 um, gene or BRCA2 or HER2 positive. There's certain 
indicators, these biomarkers that indicate the type of cancer you have, and what can we do to shut down the proliferation of those cancer cells? It sounds very technical and very complicated, and cancer itself is a, a, a very complicated disease, but understanding what's important for the development of these cancer cells and to stop it is where we are in biomedical research today. Wow, are you yeah. sure you're not a physician yourself by now? Yeah. I mean, you've yeah. pretty much done your seven years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, well, it's one of the benefits of being on the speaking circuit is yeah. I stay at these conferences. I sit and listen, and sooner or later, uh, I'm reminded of my English teacher in high school. If you hear it over and over, ultimately it begins to sink in. So, uh, and you get I've, to understand it. You get, and, and I surprise myself. I, yes. I have fun with my own doctor and talk about things like histone deacetylation, which scares her, and she's amazed that <laughs> I've tried to learn as much as possible about this. Yeah, uh, how can yeah. people get in touch with you and know yeah. more about um, yeah. cancer, the researches that are out there? Yeah, I, I have a, a website. Uh, it's jack Whalen, W-H-E-L-A-N.com, and uh, it's focused on blood cancers, but uh, being a, an advocate, I've got to meet a lot of other patients ar around the U.S., around the world, and uh, so on my website, there are other, some basic information about blood cancers and other types of cancer. Um, and of course, I'm available through uh, email and telephone connections and that. So, but go to the website. That's probably a, a good way to get in touch if you yeah. need to talk. Yeah. And I think, yeah. you know what, one of the most helpful things that um, happens is when you can bring him to your organization, to yeah. your company, and he can talk in person about, you know, the experience and what, you know, treatment options are out there. So I just want to thank you so much for having, you know, graced yeah. us with your presence because I know that there were a lot of terms that that when I was reading your website, I said, oh, I don't know how many of those words I can mm -hmm. even pronounce, let yeah. alone know what yeah. they mean. Yeah. So that was scary in itself. Yeah. I hope that we were able to decipher, you know, those words, yes. make it as simple yes. as yeah. possible. Yeah. Any last few words that you might want the audience to know? Yeah, well, the, you know, these complex words um, are, were really developed by the physicians, the good doctors and the researchers that... Um, work in the labs and the clinics. And for them, they're very precise language. You know, when you say a hematologic malignancy, they understand what that means. You know, for us, you know, it means a blood cancer, for example. Um, but for them, it's much more specific. So it's important that we try to raise up to their level and they need to come down to our level as well. So um, the, the, the buzzwords, the the difficult jargon that we sometimes uh, live with makes it scary scenario as well. Yes. So it's important, I think, that all of us try to learn as much as possible. If you, my, my, my key message for all yes. is if you're diagnosed with cancer, don't rely on what 95% of us do. Only 5% of us participate in clinical trials. We're not spending enough time looking at forward-looking science most of us rely on what our primary care physician recommends. In many cases, that's the historical outlook. I would rather see people look at what's available in clinical trials. There's so many myths and misconceptions about clinical trials. You know, we're reminded of these Hollywood movies that says, gee, before the person doesn't survive, let's get them into a clinical trial. Yeah. Uh, that's not where we are today. With genetics and genomics, we've learned so much more about the biology of cancer there's a lot of reason to be hopeful and to be helpful going forward. We could talk all day. We could. Yes, we could talk you. all day. Great. You know, um, I hope that you can take the time to go on his website, which will be at the bottom of the screen, and also contact him through email or phone calls. Until next time, thank you for watching The Dr. Stam Show. Thank you for listening to the Dr. Stem Show. Have a terrific week.